Get out a pen and paper and write this down. Or a pencil. Why don't you send some physical mail to the Grimerica Show? At P.O. Box 16033. Next line. Uh huh. 100-815, 17th Avenue, SW. Next line. Uh huh. Calgary, Alberta. Next line. Uh huh. Canada. Next line. Uh huh. T2T space 5H7. That's the P.O. Box. Why don't you send Darren some dirty socks? Cause he's got a dirty sock fetish. Uh-huh. Why don't you send Graham some gold bowling? Cause he's got a gold bowling fetish. Uh-huh. Send him some gold. Send him some gold. Send him some gold in the P.O. Box. P.O. Box. P.O. Box. A get physical. A get physical. A get physical. Everybody loves to get physical and get physical mail in the mailbox. So send them. I think they're very cognizant of this, of this material. Um, that, that this is one of the arguments against this is against this is you will constantly hear thrown around as oh these guys had no knowledge of this you know th- this is bull. Um, these guys are very well in tuned uh, to this material. Okay, guys, welcome back to the Grime America Show. We are going to be chatting with the one and only Robert W. Sullivan the Fourth a little bit later. Uh, one of the few people who got to come back for a third time in Grime America, mostly because he emails an ass. If, if everyone else emailed an ass, anyone can come on the show. But Sully remembers us. I like that. I like that he keeps us in line when his new book comes out. Yeah. And it's always full of good, and we're right in the Hollywood groove as well, talking about that stuff. So it's it's a very appropriate, and it's good. To, it's fun to talk talk to him about it. Yeah, it's probably a good idea to go back and check out some of his other episodes. We had him on twice. The first one, we really get into the Masonic stuff. I think we probably did repeat ourselves a bit on that one. No, this, this time. one, I think we it's were hard a little bit tell. more fourth. Or we were a little bit more. Um, it's hard to tell sometimes. We asked, especially some when it's been like. That other one has been four years since we yeah. did that interview. It's hard yeah. to remember. And I didn't listen to it. Well, I meant to listen to them, but I just, I can't stand listening to you. I can't stand listening to me either. <laughs> <laughs> or I guess you. Anyway, yeah, he's coming up. We're going to talk about his new book, Cinema Symbolism 2. And we get into to Freemason stuff as well. We ask him about that. He's pretty candid. He's, he's open about it. It's pretty cool. Of course, that there, folks, is one and only Graham Dunlop. Graham, the Anima Enigma Dunlop. Thanks, buddy. How's it going, buddy? Good. How you doing? Well, not too bad. I got a new monitor. Cleaned up the studio a bit. Got a new shelf. That was nice. Yeah, it looks it looks way better in here. Looks I don't know. We might have talked like about it. that already, but I can't yeah, remember. Probably. So, I mean, we are we do have lots of content here. We're just trying to find the time to release it. So, hopefully, you'll see some more episodes coming out. We planned on getting more out before this one, but it just didn't happen. So, it's getting the intro. soon. Soon, yeah, yeah. Well, we can cut a couple of these short, maybe too. But people get upset. Come with some blowback. Yeah, comes with blowback. Um, no, I think I'm out of town this weekend and then things are going to start to settle down for the winter. Time to settle in. Yep. So that's when we can, I think we should probably be able to plow. I mean, we're sitting on a lot of interviews right now. Well, I think the Matheson one, we can probably pop out with a little five minute intro. Oh, that's just because what I was thinking. That's exactly. been available on YouTube. Yeah, for that's a while. what I was so, thinking. I mean, if you're yeah. Jones and for content, check out the YouTube channel. The interview with Dave Matheson is there already. We did a bunch of video with some visuals. It's great. Um, Graham will link to it. That's about the star uh, star myths. Mm-hmm. Which will come out. I think we'll just, since that's highly video based, I think we'll just do like a five minute intro for that one and then drop it as like a bonus app type thing. Exactly. And, uh, but yeah, I, I, I highly recommend if you've got the ability to check out the YouTube channel, do there. We're able to get it with the, a little picture of the studio, a little picture of Dave, and then a big picture of what he was presenting. I was playing around a little bit with the different. I was playing, what's the word, like TV producer, or not producer, who's the guy in the, the, the editor, controller? The control room? The controller. I'm the guy in the control room. That was like camera two, camera on. I only had two cameras. <laughs> I was just talking to myself. So. How'd I go? Were you answering too? I don't know. I haven't watched the video. I think it went okay. What I would do is if we were really talking about- I meant about, the conversation with yourself. To no, you're it's, as it's well. a mess. Yeah. It's mostly a mess, yeah. Well, it's mostly myself agreeing with myself that other people are idiots. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening to the latest THC. I don't know if it's the latest, but I was listening to one today, like yelling. I, I'm like this far away from like 
texting Carl with him. You're like, you're almost like blaming him as the flat earth guy. Oh, wow. And I, and I like the one flat earth guy. I forget his name, Eric Dubai or whatever. Because at least he, he comes with a little more knowledge, I think. I find these flat earth guys, some of the arguments are just a little too silly. And then I can't. Once that happens one time, then I have trouble. Hmm. But Eric Dubai, I can, you know, sometimes he can, I'm on board with him sometimes. He's like, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're fucking crazy, but you're right. In what regard? Explain a little bit more if you could. Like, well, I think the the one that got me today was when he was talking about a, how a, how come a helium balloon filled with helium doesn't just fall to the ground because of gravity. And it's like, well, it's like, well, nowhere in any sort of understanding of gravity or weight or air pressure or any of those things should that happen. Isn't it lighter than, lighter than air? It's lighter than air. That's why. And we're not in a vacuum. If we were in a vacuum, it quite possibly would. It's the helium that's lighter than air that presents the problem. Oh, I see. So if that's your argument, then I have a problem right out of the gate. Oh, I thought if, you were talking you about Eric Dubai. If, if you can't thought experiment your way around how that works or why that works, then... Whose argument is this? This is this other guy. Oh, yeah, okay. Today. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. 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 Anyway, we've spent too much time on the subject already. already. Yeah. What do you got? We do have a bunch we'll get of, some blowback for that. We dude. do have a bunch of recommendations on flat earth. Don't we have some people in the chats that are flat earthers? I think Jerry's a flat earther. I wonder Jerry, if Jerry teaches about the flat earth. I like Jerry a lot. <laughs> Love the guy. So do I. I don't think there's flat. I wonder if Michael's a flat earther. I've never outright asked him. But he see if so. He seems like the type. He could be the first person I know in person. The well, first, can we, why don't we do a bonus episode with Jerry and Michael, and we'll have them in, and for you know the black budget where we get into it. The flat Earth. Yeah. If we do a we'll do a flat Earth show for the black budget, so we can argue. Yeah, because that's the thing is if I, if I have a flat Earther and I'm not going to be able to just shut up. Well, let's do it. So we'll get and into I the don't want to throw an up an argument into a regular feed because that's yeah. not what we do here. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, fine. Begrudgingly. So speaking, speaking of the of black the... budget, <laughs> jinx. <laughs> don't, don't point at me. Um, speaking of the black budget, guys, we did just drop a new episode in there. Uh, we talked about Disney and occult and uh, Illuminati and all sorts of fun Addiction stuff. Addiction like treatment that. centers in Delray, Florida. That's yeah. pretty crazy. Yeah, we had a great chat with Salvatore Antithesis. It's an awesome one. Uh, check it out. A lot of people like that. If you're not in the black budget feed, check out grimmarker.ca slash support today and sign up for a monthly or send a one-time donation our way so we can send that link back your way. Yeah, anything. Anything gets you the link. Anything. Just send us some money so we can eat some food and we'll give you the link. <laughs> um, and, of course, I think Mr. Grimsteak of Cruising with Steak, great podcast over there. Check that shit out, guys. It's a good one. Um, it's even more casual than this. What was the point about Cruising with Steak? He's working on uh, psilocybin. Oh, too. geez, yeah, that might not be salvageable. Set. So we did the mushroom episode in the cabin. Yeah. I don't know. If the mushroom episode in the cabin. Something might not be better than nothing on this pretty one. Something hand. might just be worse. You guys let us know if you think something's better than nothing. Because no. Grimstake's having trouble. I think we were banging on the table a little bit too much. He's like, it sounds like someone's playing drums on the mic. Well, we probably were. <laughs> I might have been. But So we'll see what happens there. I mean, we might have to try again. What happened was I forgot the digital recorder at home and didn't realize it until I got to the cabin. And you had fake news about stems being more potent than caps. That's right. That but I still help. ate a lot of stems. Yeah, but the, the stems, I mean, you know, that's just not... Fuck, I was high. Were you? Well, I fucking lied on the ground, bawling my eyes out laughing. You weren't like, too high enough to make fun of me, that's for sure. You were making fun of me, and I was thinking, he can't be that high if he's still making fun of me. You guys had your little inside jokes about me and the moon and stared up at the stars. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, he can't be that high if he's still fucking worried about making fun of me. True. Yeah, that's what made me wonder. I don't know why I would have gained myself. You know, all my life I've known the caps are the best I part. I know. <laughs> what the guy talked into it. <laughs> talked into eating a bunch of stems. <laughs> <laughs> but wait, I probably ate a good three and a, three, three and a half grams of stems. It was still a laugh. Apparently that's more of a body high instead of a spiritual high. Somebody was explaining that balance is important between the two. Really? Yeah. Well, all I've left is caps. 
<laughs> Look out. You're going to leave your body next time. That'll be a good experiment, actually. And Perfect. just do yeah, three and a half taps and see how it goes. Holy fuck. <laughs> We'll have to do that in the cold at the cabin so that we can't leave the trailer. Yeah. But we didn't have the ability to... It was tough. We only had one mic that only worked off a laptop because I forgot the digital recorder, the brand new digital recorder. Yeah. Never job. been used. Brand new. Yeah. Anyway. That's the purpose of the go bag. That's right. It wasn't in the go bag. Oh, really? I had taken it out because I was showing it off to someone and then I left it. <laughs> This is what I deal with here. Uh, Just like that postcard that's been sitting there for a week. That's because fucking Joe Brick had to fucking be a funny guy. So now Joe Brick waits. I'll actually mail it. I'll try and mail it tomorrow. Okay. It's been a week. He yeah. suffered enough. There's Joe, two stickers. Joe Brick, your magnets are in the mail. Two stickers and three magnets. I'll send them now. I forgive you, Joe Brick. All right, uh, so check out grammarica.ca support, slash support, guys. Sign up for a monthly if you can. It really does help a whole lot. Um, then we could use more. Like I said before, I think we're still at, we're still barely at 1% if we're at 1% for a support rate. I'd like to see that hit like 2 or 3, you know? Yeah, for sure. THC does 10. Yeah. Yeah, but they have the tr trickier content where it's like yeah. they suck you into the second half of the show. We don't want to do that. We just we just ask for your support in uh, more of a Canadian it's way. too much work. <laughs> a polite way. Yeah. Like, come on, please. <laughs> All right. Onward and upward. So we do like it when we get listener feedback and stories and synchronicities and all that good stuff. I have a few to read. Oh, can you do the one about the stuff? I'm, I keep forgetting to talk about that. You have that one? Do you know what I'm talking about? No. About sending in your junk? No. To the show? Instead of cash? If you don't have cash? It's supposed to be an email? Yeah. You were talking about it to me. I don't know what you're talking We've about. We fucking had a conversation about it. He was like, oh, maybe ask people to send you old audio cards or... Oh. Stuff like that. People might have a microphone or a monitor or... Whatever oh, else. geez, I don't know how, I don't know where to find that. I don't, I'm anyway, not, ready. I'm a, not ready for that. Okay. But anyway, it was, you a, could good, explain it was it. a good point. Basically, the the premise was that he had put out that, you know, I have some old audio equipment here. I got a couple of old Shure SM58s. Do you want them? Or would, you know, and even if we didn't need them, we could have them as a backup. Sell them on Key Kijiji. Oh, yeah, you had well. mentioned that even if people send you stuff and you don't need it, sell it on Kijiji for the value. But, I mean, definitely old audio equipment, we, we would probably have some interesting X, XM, XLR cords. Yeah. Old sure yeah, microphones. One eight and one eight cords. I mean, eights those are always going. We go like, through like crazy. The adapters. The like one eight just, splitters we go through like crazy. For some reason. Um, don't they make quality stuff anymore? Like, no, yeah. they don't. It's hard to find quality electronics these days. It really is. Um, so if you have anything like that lying around, you know, if you, if you have some around and you're wondering if it's something the show needs, shoot me an email. And if we need it. Yeah, we don't want to see like a whole bunch of like, like old value. phone cords. And yeah, we like don't need fucking stuff. iPhone 4 chargers. <laughs> <laughs> but an idea. If got, I mean, we could always use another monitor. You know what? Mr. Owl's got those fucking solid state hard, solid state hard drives. I just got to send him the model number of the computers. Oh, cool. But I don't know how to put They're it. external or? You don't want to be putting. You're That's the problem. Of, they're internal? I think On so. a Mac? And I don't think James yeah, can put it in. I don't want to be messing around with that. I haven't seen Mr. Al in the chats in a while. I hope he's okay. Hope so speaking okay, of Mr. that, Al. that's our perpetual chats, and the, the link is in the show notes. It's a Discord, uh, Discord channel where everybody just hangs around there most of the day. Stop on by, stop on by. Stop on by, stop on by. Stop on by, stop on by. Head on over to the Grand Rapids. Yoo-hoo! It is a yoo-hoo. It's a big yoo-hoo. Check it out, guys. Gramerica.ca slash chats. I think we're up to like 200 and some people in there now. You definitely don't, don't notice it. Some people are a lot more prevalent than others. I mean, I pop in once a day, at least see what's going on. Usually in the morning, then again in the evening. I try. I'm sucked into a separate channel for D&D &D right now. And so. I, I tend to post pictures of Graham that he doesn't know I take in there. So that's another little little <laughs> snippet from the chats. I catch most of them, I think. That one? Yeah, I couldn't believe how fast you caught that one. I posted it, like, right away, you were like, fuck you. 
It was literally within like a second of me posting it. Yeah, it just happened to be in there. And I saw a picture of me that was pretty creepy. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Plus, it was a fucking terrible picture of me, which made it worse. They all are. That was the one where I tricked you into thinking I was showing you a picture. Yeah. But it was actually <laughs> taking a picture of you. <laughs> yeah, check out the chats, guys. All sorts of fun stuff over there. Okay, what do you want? Uh, I got a couple of st- listener stories and uh, synchronicities. Ooh, let's go with. I'm a rambling gram with synchronicities all over the web. And Darren is skeptical about everyone and don't believe it yet. I think I turned that up a little too loud. Sorry, guys. Might have clipped. So, okay, this is a this is a synchronicity story from Peter. It's called Peter's Synchro Story. Hey, Darren and Graham, how you guys going? So you can tell right off the bat he's uh, he's Aussie or something like that. First off, wicked show, my dudes. I found this rad show by typing occult comma UFO. Really? And the That's podcast the tr- section in Spotify a few months back. That's really interesting because I tried searching that in the app store and then nothing came up for our new app. But I'm surprised Occult comes up because we do want to. I want to do a little bit more on. I wonder if there's a way I can check how many people listen to the show on the app to find out if that whole debacle was worth it. Yeah, we'll see. Anyways, it is good to find out uh, from people how they found the show. Sorry, it's cool to have an app. The marketing research. It's cool to have an app. Oh come on! If it's not searchable, then what's the point? I Listen thought we, to the I show. Thought it was a marketing thing for us. So did I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Spotify, and I can see. I tried to name it the Grammarica <laughs> Podcast app, but, but Apple won't let you. You can't have podcast in the title. Really? Yeah. So there goes all your fucking. No one's searching UFOs in the App Store. Maybe they are. You probably do. But you can't, so if you search podcast in the app, podcast, podcast? in the app. I don't app, know why you search that. Podcast in the app store. Let's see what comes up. I think only, I think if you're not a podcast playing, well, I guess, well, that doesn't make sense either, because we are a podcast playing app. That's Just what I'm saying. It only plays one podcast, so. But if you can't have a, an extended description on what our show's about or all that kind of stuff, what's the point? That's why when you type in podcast, it's all just podcast players. There's not a single app in there. Hmm, that's really interesting. So, so maybe maybe I was using that. So, if I type in UFO and a cult, let's see what happens there in the app store. Yeah. Oh boy, three apps come up. Is ours one of them? No, <laughs> not even close. Oh, you know why? Because our description is just, this is... That's what that's what I mean. Like, Oh, no, it has a UFOs isn't in our description. Our description is a loose canon podcast featuring casual conversations with whomever we deem interesting. Yeah, that's Often what I... on the fringe. Okay, so, so if I type, type in loose canon, nothing happens. <laughs> type... <laughs> <laughs> There's no way to find it, I'm telling you. Except by searching <laughs> Gramerica. <laughs> Back to square yeah. one. We should have came up with a better title. Okay, so here we are. So he says in Spotify a few months back, and I can safely say this is my favorite. Well, this is pretty much the only podcast I've listened to, to so yeah, you guys pop my podcast cherry. <laughs> Sounds fucked up. And the intros are sick. I don't know what... Oh, geez. He's like, he says, uh, I don't know what the other see you in... Whoa, see you, see you next, next Tuesday. Tuesday are saying. I just... I always like them and would rather listen to them if my if the guest doesn't interest me. So anyways, I was at work today listening to the grime and I got some pretty cool synchros happening. So firstly, having listened to the most recent apps, the Grant Cameron one was Rad Balls, by the way, was scrolling through the list of the show and came across the Pepe slash Keck episode. Being a lover and practitioner of the occult, I had seen stuff about Pepe and meme magic on Reddit. That's in the occult subreddit section. So I listened to the app and it was awesome. I wanted so more. I wanted more. So I scrolled through the list again and see the Paul is dead episode. Interesting. I had seen a doc, a doco. That's what they call it. And 
Aussie land on YouTube about Paul's death a few years ago. It was called Winged Beetle, I think. Anyways, I listened to that one, I thought. So in the intro of that episode, you guys started talking about Pepe. I was like, holy shit, balls, synchro. I listened to the rest of the app and my workmate and I went to his house for lunch. While we're eating and stuff, the combo went to talking about childhood cartoon shows and how you could write into them and they would read your letter out on the show or some crap. Anyways, my workmate's girlfriend said she used to write in all the time and call radio stations and whatnot. I was thinking to myself at that point, why don't I write into the Grimerica dudes about my synchro? Nah, can't be fucked, I thought. I'm not one to do that kind of stuff. I'm more of a lurker. <laughs> 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 so continuing the story, I drove home from work, went outside to char down on some bongs and look at some shit on Reddit. I was still thinking about that synchro and deciding to look up the Pepe subreddit. I scrolled down about two posts and I fucking spit chips. They were there staring at me was a picture of four Pepe's in the Sergeant Pepper jackets. I was like, what the shit? Now I have to write in you guys. Man, that's my synchro. Hope you guys enjoy it. And hope Daza gives us a sweet score. Anyways, I can't be stuffed right anymore. Definitely Australian. So catch you later, Darren and Graham. Spam, calf, ham, Dunlop. Daz is a thing. And that's you. He's just, that's your yeah, nickname. Yeah, Daz is, a, I should get people to call me Daza. P.S. Have you heard about Simon Parks? Who's that? Yes, I have. My friend keeps telling me about him. He's an ex-politician that came out about all kinds of alien stuff. It's bloody interesting. Nice. There's also a YouTube occultist I enjoy called Joe March, or enjoy listening to Joe March. His channel is The Grand Infinity. Anyways, just two suggestions for this rad show. Catch. So here's a picture. Let's see. Of the shirt with the four peppies and dressed in the, the Beatles Sergeant Pepper garb. Wow. Nice one, eh? Hmm. Thanks, Peter. That's a good synchro. Yeah. It's almost like a double show whammy. You listen to the two episodes of the show and then seen the two episodes of the show intertwined on a t-shirt. Yeah. How the fuck is this not a simulation? Oh, yeah. That's, that's the, Beatles, <laughs> the Beatles section of that as well. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. After the two apps and going to one from and the other. And the two of the two apps intertwined into a fucking t-shirt. That same Did day. Did he buy the shirt? I, I don't know. I'll give him an 8.92. Ooh, good. Nice one. That's a that's an impressive score. That is an impressive score. It took me a second to catch up with the, uh, with the profoundness of that. <laughs> what, who is that from? Peter. Oh. You know, We're doing different things from Craig. Oh, Australia, not UK. Yeah. I, I got the guy, uh, Craig. Craig W. I don't want to say his name, but anyway. I gave him the black budget support feed. I'll give you his email, and in return, he's helping track down email addresses and stuff like that for us. So we can just send him a list of people, and he'll track down their email addresses for us. That's what I spend the most time doing when I'm looking to book guests, tracking down emails. So Craig from the UK is going to do that now. Wow. That's awesome. That is yeah, awesome. That, is, that is a lot of time for me, too. And you know what? I, it annoys me when I can't get in contact with the person I want to. Then I ask you to Ugh. find them on Facebook. And then, Make your then own fucking drops. Facebook account. <laughs> How about that? So I'll link to the episode with Pepe. And uh, Ooh, what was the other one? What was the other one? Uh, Paul is Carver. dead. Paul is dead, yeah. The Paul is dead app as well. In the show notes. So, uh, what do you Everything want? Everything that you would ever need to know about the show. Um, I got another synchro and then some uh, bonus up for uh, bonus content for subscribers. Do both. Do we have time? Both. I'll do this one and then the UFO quote, and then that's good. No, we got time. <clears throat> okay. This is from, uh, let me just make sure I can say his name. This is from Noel. This is a bit creepy. Ready for this one? Yep. Well, it's, it's kind of kind of creepy. I have an experience to share, but it's not a trip report or a synchro. At this point, I've only told a handful of close people this story, so here it goes. In 2001, I was working the graveyard shift. It was Friday, and I had a vacation plan for the following week. 
I decided to play hooky and split a little early as I completed all my assigned work. Trying not to be spotted, I crept out into the pre-dawn parking lot and climbed into my brand new F-150 Super Crew, which was my pride and joy. As I slid into the seat and closed the door, I reached to insert my key into the ignition when I heard a voice from behind me say, You should be careful. My adrenaline surged as I spun around to look in the back seat. There was nobody there. I thought to myself, I must be working too many hours. I really need this vacation. Once my heart rate came down, I tried to laugh it off and reached to insert the key again, and I heard a voice which said, I said you better be careful. Once more, I was jolted by that familiar fight-or-flight response, and I spun to look around again. This time, I actually exited the truck and opened the rear door to check. Empty. My mind was racing. Oh, no, I'm hearing voices. I was frightened, thinking I was losing my mind, and I heard the voice as clear as day. It was not my voice. It sounded like it came into my right ear as I sat facing forward. I got back in and slowly reached forward to insert the key. I got the key into the ignition. No voice. So far, so good. I turned the key. As soon as I turned the key, I had a vision, a flash, a scene of headlights coming towards my driver's side door, making impact and the view through the windshield of the truck flipping in the air. I tried to shake it off and thought, well, I will be extra careful. I eased out of the parking lot to the service drive, which loops around the factory, and I made my left-hand turn after traffic cleared and made my way home. At the first long left-hand curve, I looked ahead through the corner and saw headlights. They were in their own lane, but as that car entered the curve from the opposite direction, it continued to go straight. The speed limit is 35 on this road, but 50 is more typical of actual traffic patterns. The, this car impacted right into the driver's side door, and when my front wheels hit the curb, the truck rolled in the air, landing on the roof like a movie stunt. It happened in the blink of an eye, just like the vision I had witnessed moments earlier. I always buckle up. But with the excitement of the voice a minute ago, I totally forgot to click it. I do not remember sliding out from behind the wheel, but I ended up in the headliner, on the headliner with the driver's side door totally caved in and the smell of gasoline leaking everywhere. The truck was a total loss, but I crawled out of the shattered window and walked away from that without a scratch. And I always wonder, what if I buckled up? I was 35 when this happened. I've never heard any voices before. Never had any kind of prior mystical experience. And I have never told anyone other than my wife of what I heard that morning for fear of ridicule. Well, you just told a whole ton of people. <laughs> <laughs> However, six years later, I was settling in to watch some college football. My wife walked by and said she was going to run to the store to get some groceries or to, re to return some purchases. I told her to have fun, and she started to walk away. The same voice I had heard six years earlier said, if you let her go, you'll never see her again. I ran after her and told her what had just happened. She just turned to me with her hands on her hips, smiled, and said, So, what game are we watching today? All I can think of is it wasn't my time, or hers. We are both well, and there must be something that we are put here on this earth to do that we haven't accomplished yet. Strange, but 100% true. Always looking forward to your episodes as well as now being able to catch up on the Black Budget support feed. Keep on rocking in the free world. Keep on rocking. In the free is that like is that what they call the third man effect or something, like a guardian angel kind of thing? I mean, makes you wonder. Isn't the third man when you're by yourself? I don't know. Wouldn't that be the second man? Yeah, I don't know. Or is that when you think about yourself? It reminds me of those person. and those hand like where a hand comes out and grabs your wheel and turns the car, or like you know that like that. What do they call that? Yeah, that's like guardian it's like angel. The manifestation shit. of the hand, or yeah, the, the, yeah, the hand is. is the manifestation of the voice. Pretty hard to ignore, though, eh? After that, imagine having that vision and getting a hit. Truck rolls over and you're you're okay. You walk without a scratch. Yeah. Well, it, he's got to be some sort of clairvoyant, some level of clairvoyance, I would assume. He's able to peep through. But only at heightened levels of emotion, the future emotion that he would have felt. Somehow let him peek through. Yeah. The emotion of dying if he was wearing his seatbelt or the emotion of losing his wife. 
somehow rippled that veil enough that he could see it beforehand. Yeah. It's just him it's just him talking to himself. No, it's not him talking to himself. It's a voice. Yeah, but the voice is his future self. Oh, I see what you mean. Right? Yeah, maybe. Who knows? I can't rate that, though. Unrateable. <laughs> All right. Which one was that? Was that a synchro? No. All right, well, do your quote then and talking to the mic. Quit chewing your nails. Do you have a quote? So, this is the UFO quote of the week. We've got no conclusions, except after this, do not give us the old routine of Venus, weather balloons, aircraft, and the like, which has been given as a general panacea for almost every case of UFOs. That's from Captain Jose Lemos Ferreira, with Sergeants Alberto Covas and Salvador Oliveira, and Manuel Marcelino, after an alleged encounter with a UFO on a flight out of the Ota Air Base in Portugal. Nice. There you have it. Yep. What else you got? That's it, buddy. I think that's about it. Yep. Here, keep talking for a Keep sec. talking. Yeah, we want to thank everybody for their support, and thanks for listening, and really glad you found the show, and really hope that you like this great chat with Robert Sullivan, and we've got lots of content coming out, and we're looking forward to releasing it. We've got lots booked. Got some really, really interesting stuff, too. The Halloween episode is going to be crazy. Okay, we're good. Could be oh, my cra- oh, yeah, that was favorite. a great one. The one we're is getting? that going in our regular feed, then, or is yeah, that a absolutely. Budget? It is oh, yeah. not. I don't know if this is going to play or not. This is a new jingle. I just want to play a new jingle. I don't think you've heard it yet. Oh, no. That's not about you. Okay, good. It's fucking... Get out a pen and paper and write this down. Or a pencil. Why don't you send some physical mail to the Grimerica Show? At P.O. Box 16033. Next line. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. 100-815, 100-815, comma, 17th Avenue, SW, next line, uh-huh. Calgary, Alberta, next line, uh-huh. Canada, next line, uh-huh. T2T, space, 5H7, that's the Rio box. Why don't you send Darren some dirty socks, cause he's got a dirty sock fetish. Uh-huh. Why don't you send Graham some gold bullying, cause he's got a gold bullying fetish. Uh-huh. Send him some gold. Send him some gold. Send him some gold in the P.O. box. A P.O. box. P.O. box. A get physical. A get physical. A get physical. Everybody loves to get physical and get physical mail. What? Isn't that great? Yeah, I true. love it. It is true. Nothing beats physical mail at the P.O. box, and I do love dirty socks. I'm Bob. Right on. Whatever you want to call it. Send Graham some gold. Send me some socks. All right, guys. And some cash. My real money is nice too. Hey, you see that American money all crisp instead of our like, our money's starting to look more and more like Cuban pesos every fucking new rendition, like convertible Cuban pesos. All right, guys. Enjoy the chat with uh, Robert W. Sullivan, the third, right? Fourth. 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 Tonight we're excited to have Robert W. Sullivan IV back in, in studio. I think it's his third time here. Yeah, he's a best-selling author, a Freemason, historian, a philosopher, antiquarian. 
And his new book uh, just come came out this year, Cinema Symbolism 2, More Esoteric Imagery in Popular Movies. So we're, uh, we're looking forward to talking to you about that. Welcome back, Robert. Hey, guys. Uh, Baron, Graham, thank you for having me back on Gramerica. It's my pleasure to be here. Yeah, I think the first time was for Royal Arch of Enoch. Second time was for Cinema Symbolism. So, yeah, it's uh, wonderful to be back. And uh, thank you for having me on for Cinema Symbolism 2. I'm look, looking forward to uh, the conversation. Yeah, symbolism and masonry and all that is always uh, is always super relevant. It seems to tie into a little bit of a little bit of everything um, yeah, that we yeah, talk I about here. Yeah, I tend to agree. It's uh, it's it's you know, my first book was nearly seven hundred pages. Then the first cinema book was nearly five hundred, and this one's almost up to seven. So yeah, it's a lot to talk about. It's a lot to go over, and. Uh, Certainly, you know, I talked about masonry and Masonic symbols in Royal Arch of Enoch and in Cinema Symbolism, too. I actually have a chapter called Freemasonry in Popular Culture. So, yeah, uh, it, it definitely is influential. I, I can't argue with you there. Yeah, guys, check out our, our last two episodes with Robert. We'll link to him in the show notes. Um, what movies did you focus on this time? Right, right. So uh, Cinema Symbolism 2 takes on a new slate of movies. I revisited a couple from the first book that I wanted to expound upon, but I've got all kind of new, uh, look apart new films. I have a horror movie uh, section where I got into Kubrick's The Shining and a lot of the repetition going on in that. Um, there's an interesting study with the movie Crimson Peak and its nexus to The Shining. Um, that's interesting. I have a chapter on Freemasonry, which I was just talking about. I get into films such as Stargate and The Man Who Would Be King. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a chapter, um, not necessarily movies made by the Illuminati, but I have a chapter on what we call the Illuminati in film. Uh, movies such as uh, They Live and Stanley Kubrick again, Eyes Wide Shut. I have a chapter on uh, the Spaghetti Westerns, uh, very interesting, some very interesting archetypal imagery going on in that. Uh, I did uh, finally got around to uh, David Lynch and Alan Moore. Uh, these were two, two sets of films that I was originally planning on taking on in cinema symbolism, but alas, I ran out of time and space. So I did uh, three Alan Moore movies, uh, From Hell, V for Vendetta, and The Watchmen. And then with David Lynch, I was originally planning on taking on Twin Peaks mm -hmm. uh, TV show. Now, when, when I was writing this, the new series hadn't come out yet, and I should just say I haven't seen that yet. Um, I've not watched any of the new 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 series, and I haven't watched Twin Peaks, the old series, in quite a while. Uh, it would have gone on forever; it would have just taken too much time. So, I just focused on some of his some of my favorite movies by him that are replete with symbolism: uh, Blue Velvet, Lost Highway, Mulholland Drive, and uh, uh, what was the other one there? Uh, oh, Dune, Dune, uh, the uh, Frank Herbert movie. Hmm. So, yeah, it, it's it's all new movies. Uh, I'm really happy with the way the book came out. Uh, and uh, like I said, uh, you know, I'm already started outlining Cinema Symbolism 3. So even more to talk about. So is that is that what it is? It astounds me that there's just that much symbolism in, in these Hollywood movies. That you can keep writing books about it. I mean, we've also talked about uh, Jay Dyer's stuff on like the esoteric Hollywood. And it, it's starting to make me look at look at things differently, especially movies and TV shows. Now they all it seems so much more uh, intentionally well, it's like between that and the propagandic aspect of it. Uh, yeah. It's like I'd rather the mythology ones. Anyway, I'd rather the symbolic mythology than the propaganda. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the the, the symbolism, I, I think, is unquestioned. Uh, I mean, I, I would say that I don't find it in every movie. Certainly not all movies contain it. Uh, but if you get a filmmaker who and, and filmmakers who are um, sophisticated, you, you will find it. Uh, and, you know, you will find political, um, you know, hints and, and, and things like that in films. Although in some aspects, especially right now, they're trying to tone this down a little bit. They don't want to isolate half their audience. Um, <laughs> Quite literally, but you will find political metaphors in film and, and, you know, like you said, propaganda. I mean, that's certainly you find you look at a movie even going back into the 40s, something like Yankee Doodle Dandy, which is completely pro-war, World War II propaganda. Uh, so, you know, it does go back. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's definitely going on. No, no question about it. I wouldn't have written two books about it if I was 100 percent convinced it wasn't intentional. I do I do get into some aspects of it where maybe it's not intentional and. You know, this this ties into things like Carl Jung and the collective unconscious, and we get into the deep works of Plato and things like that. But don't get me wrong. I mean, I think these filmmakers know exactly what they're doing. They're drawing on ancient mythology, symbolism, the occult, uh, and it, it definitely is transforming the, the movie, making it more powerful. And certainly, God knows, they're printing money off of it, so they must be doing something right. So how can we do that with a podcast? <laughs> well, you know, I don't know. Um 
you could, I guess, suppose it's funny you mentioned that, that it's actually somewhat salient because, um, you know, you, you could perhaps I'm staring here looking at your logo. I like it. The Easter Island with the uh, headphones and the UFO behind him. You could you could come up with something with a logo, perhaps. I mean, but I like what you have. I think it's very interesting and certainly is eye catching. Um, but it was funny. I was on with another uh, uh, podcast. I was on another podcast just the other night. And uh, the woman is actually a writer like I am. And she said something very interesting to me, and it resonated. Um, and she says, you know, when I write these books, because I do the same thing. She said, you know, when I write these books or my short stories or whatever, I put little clues in and little references and, you know, things like that and hope people pick up. And I do the same thing. Um, so so there must be something to this with movie makers wanting to do it, because I know God knows as an author, I do it myself. Um, so, you know, maybe it's more commonplace and, you know. You know, maybe filmmakers just enjoy doing it as a game of chess, challenging the author or, or excuse me, I guess in the case of a movie, the viewer to, to go find this stuff. But, um, you know, it, it's definitely going on. I have no question about well, that. I, Disney's I, always been good on it. We're I, actually going to do a show on the just the Disney little sneak ins. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I got <laughs> someone lined up. I've been thinking about that recently. I can't believe you guys are talking about that because after knowing that you were coming back on and and we had we were also talking about it somewhere else where how the film and and. Uh, and music might line up and all this and how people do it intentionally David and David Charles played. And, and I was wondering if, um, like, how can we incorporate that in our podcast? Like, does that give you some extra power or some extra, um, you know what I mean? Some extra force there in a way, if you, if you put sort of hidden messages or hidden meanings in there, is there a magical component to it? And then I was, you've already sort of answered some of my initial questions about whether it's it's unintentional or intentional or whether it's just the the creator of the film or is is her you know sometimes is is other symbolism getting slid in there you know without them knowing about it as, as well that you yeah, know that. That, yeah that's a great question um because i you know it, you know i think i think a lot of times it's the director and the producer and and really you know the the guys the higher ups the collaborators with it uh, but you can certainly get into script writers and and production designers um, in- interesting that you will have, um, there are two movies out and they, the, the two movies, uh, echo each other very much. So, uh, one movie you may have seen, you probably have seen or heard of the other one, maybe not. Uh, the, and we don't have to talk about it, but I'm just making a point. The movies are black Swan, which was Darren Aronofsky. And then there was another movie that came out a few years later called Stoker, uh, which was made by, I believe a Japanese filmmaker named Chan Wu Park. And, uh, th- those two movies have the same production designer. And they, they actually trade on some of the exact same symbolism. So you, you can pin that down as to what she was doing. I mean, they're, they're very similar. Uh, and, and this woman clearly knew what she was doing. And it's funny, too, because Stoker actually references Black Swan. Hmm. It, they, they have somewhat of a parallel storyline. And she actually puts stuff in to tip you off to this. Hmm. Uh, so, so, so it is interesting. It's not necessarily the director, per se. You know, it is a collaborative ep- effort. Um, but also, on the other hand, when you get into things like Walt Disney, a lot of times with that, you know, when you get into, the, you know, now the Disney stuff does have esoteric symbolism. But when you get into some of the more, you know, racy things where they put the pornographic still in the rescuers or things like that. I mean, to me, that's more of just an animator screwing around, um, <laughs> you, know, you know, tongue in cheek almost. I mean, I, I wouldn't necessarily necessarily produce or, or ascribe. I guess that's the better word. Uh, a sinister motive to that, where to me, something like that's just, you know, uh, the animator just screwing around for the hell of it, basically. Yeah. So, I, I, and then the collective unconscious part, the, the you know, the Jungian part of this, how, you know, it's it's amazing because we, when we talk to these other people and, and some of your symbolism, like it really does seem like there's coincidences and synchronicities and and dates and times and all this stuff lining up that couldn't even be created by us. It's like there's a higher power orchestrating this artistic, you know, synchronicity. And uh, so have you found that during during the search as well? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I have. Um, I have found I, I make the point that I believe this is intentionally placed. I have documented filmmakers who have incorporated esoteric imagery, and I'm 100 percent convinced they had no knowledge of what they were actually putting in their movie. Huh. Uh, for instance, uh, in, in the, the uh, Ed Wood movie, uh, Ed Wood, it was a very uh, he's well known now, but he made a string of B movies. He was just a horrendous filmmaker. Um, he's often credited as the worst uh, filmmaker in history, but but his movies have his, his movies have attained a cult status here because they're so bad they're good. Uh, but in in one of his early movies, uh, it was a movie called Glenn or Glenda. 
he actually presents one of the greatest examples of a Gnostic demiurge on film. And I'm 100 percent convinced that it's completely unintentional. I mean, I, I don't think Wood knew what he was doing. But I'm often asked, especially when he gets into Gnosticism, you know, give me an example of the demiurge on film. And I'm always going back to this film. Uh, the, the, if you ever sit down and watch it, the movie's called Glenn or Glenda. Uh, if you ever sit down and watch this thing, it's only like 60 minutes long or something. I mean, it's just it's just silly. It's a ridiculous movie. But um, he casts Bela Lugosi as this god of the material world and puppet master. And uh, it's literally one of the greatest uh, Gnostic demiurges you will see on screen. And I am 100 percent convinced it's uh, unintentional. When you get into, and again, this ties into the whole Carl Jung collective unconscious uh, aspect of this. When you get into synchronicity, that's also an interesting phenomenon where it seems like there is symbolism and uh, uh, esoterica uh, surrounding a film um, that you know just seems to be coming from a higher power. I actually have documented um, where this can actually impact people's lives. Uh, and 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 it, it, I talk about this in the first in the first movie book, and I, I mentioned it in the second one. And it's an interesting study, and and you just can't, you just really, it's one of those things you just can't um, explain this. Um, if if you look at the career and life of Elvis Presley, the the uh, musician, the king of rock and roll, his life is just surrounded um, with solar allegory from start to finish. It was almost like it was investing him as this sort of Apollo you know, the God of music, the God of rock and roll, solar symbolism from start to finish, from his birth to his death. Um, and I can't account for it. I don't know why this is. I don't know what, why this is happening. Um, but if you if you study the life of Elvis Presley, you will just re- repeatedly um, come away with just seeing one solar emblem, solar symbol surrounding this man um, after another. And I chalk it up to Jungian synchronicity. It's the only thing I can I can explain to I can, it's the only thing I can come up with to explain it. It's, it's a remarkable study. So, so do the powers that be, and I mean, I know, you know, you're a Freemason and all this, so every, people will think that you're, you know, somehow connected to all this, but I mean, we've had enough Freemasons on that, it, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to be the case to me, but I mean, the powers that be, there's a, there seems to be the light shining on these, uh, this occult activity of, of the powers that be lately, especially, and are they tapping into this, this, um, you know, this collective unconsciousness or this, I don't know how to even describe it. Are they tapping in and using that, you know, for power? I mean, can you see that that's going on as well through occult yeah. practices? Or yeah, I, I kind of don't disagree with that. I, I may not. I, I agree with. I agree with what you're saying. I don't know if their motive would be that. I think a lot of times these filmmakers are very prideful, um, and I think for them, especially when you get into things like movies such as The Matrix. Um, or the Star Wars movies, especially four, five, and six, yeah. or films such as Black Swan. I mentioned that again. Um, or Kubrick with The Shining, uh, or Eyes Wide Shut. I-, I believe their motivation is. I think they're very cognizant of this of this material. Um, that, that this is one of the arguments against this is against this is you will constantly hear thrown around as oh these guys had no knowledge of this you know that this is bull. Um, these guys are very well in tuned uh, to this material. Um, through through cinematography, through training uh, in Hollywood, you know, Manly P. Hall's Philosophical Research Society is a stone to throw away. Mm-hmm. Um, these guys are these guys are very well tuned into to this, and I believe that a lot of the or not a lot. I mean, I'm not them, but I think the motivation for them in, in doing a lot of this is, uh, I believe it's for them. It's a, a way of creating modern day mythology. Um, so in that aspect, I guess it is power. Um, certainly look at the Star Wars movies. I mean, those are so ingrained in material and popular culture. I mean, things have taken on a life of their own. So for the, the filmmaker, I believe, you know, that that could be a motivation for this. Certainly power is part of it, but it's also, you know, power in creating modern day mythology, shaping material culture, shaping popular culture, just shaping culture in general. Uh, and, I, I, you know, I, I think that's a very powerful elixir for these guys. Yeah, and, and intentionally hiding things in there to it's like that uh you know, it's almost like having to be invited into it by a vampire or something, right? You're letting that you're letting that intention out and even if it's in a hidden way, it sort of excuses that karmic repercussion or something. I mean, I feel like there's something to that as well, where they can start you know, they can put out these movies that are really disinformation campaigns on what could be going on. And you know, now when people look at you know, there's a new movie coming out about uh, weather, weather warfare. And, you know, now when people talk about the real weather modifications going on, it's just going to seem like it's disinformation because, oh, they, you know, they made a movie about it. It kind of discredits the whole phenomenon. 
Yeah, I mean, you, you, you could certainly, um, you know, say that. Uh, I, I think it's interesting that, you know, it's a two way it's a two way street with the symbolism um, because. You know, you could say, okay, well, they hide it and, you know, they use it and it's maybe manipulative. But when you find, when you discover it, you're watching something entirely different. And you want you to decode it, uh, you know, then, then it's a toy, then they're exposed. Um, and then, you know, you know what to look for and, and you've figured it out. So by putting it in there, yeah, it can t- contain hidden messages, but it also can reveal hidden messages. Um, and yeah. that's really exciting for me. Uh, it, you know, I was trying to discover what these uh, films uh, you know, we're revealing these deeper layers uh, to these films. And believe you me, many of them have them. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, I don't know, you know, you know, I, I think Hollywood, I think it's almost like the cause and reaction and then reaction and cause almost. I think a lot of times in, in, in Hollywood, they are very tuned into um, alternative media conspiracy and they form shows around it. I mean, and, you know, you, you take a look at the X-Files, for example. Um, I mean, a lot, a lot of that, a lot of the mythology of that show, the really deep mythology, mm-hmm. um, this, this came out of the works of Bill Cooper, mm-hmm. uh, that there was this government conspiracy with the aliens and you had the secret cabal, this Illuminati style group. Um, so, you know, you know, these, these guys pick, pick up on this and, uh, you know, I, I guess, you know, they, they see it as an alternative way of, uh, you know, maybe exploiting um, you know, something, if they, if, they, if, if they feel it's powerful and people like it, um, Hollywood isn't ashamed to try to turn a buck off of it. Yeah, that's a good point. So do you, do you have to defend yourself as a Freemason for all the conspiracy theorists out there that, that they think, you know, who is this guy uh, decoding all the symbolism when he's a Freemason himself? Like, is, is there, I mean, how is that lately for you guys? Right, right. I, I, I do it. Um, I don't back away from it at all. I mean, I'll be the first to tell you. I, I And, you know, I, I've gotten asked similar questions from this. I don't hide my Masonic membership. I'm very proud of it. Um, and I can tell you right now that my books wouldn't exist um, if it wasn't for my Masonic membership, because um, it was through Freemasonry that you really get a lesson in decoding symbolism. Uh, and you're exposed to people like Manly P. Hall, Albert Pike. And when you really start delving into their works, Um, You know, you know, you'll find a lot of the stuff turning up in film and Joseph Campbell and comparative religion and comparative symbolism and comparative mythology. So being a Freemason for me has helped me uh, Mm -hmm. tremendously. In fact, I I don't think these books, I mean, I'm pretty sure I can say with utmost confidence that these that my three books wouldn't exist, but for my Masonic membership. Um, I mean, for example, I mean, I would never have if I wasn't a Freemason, I couldn't tell you that the National Treasure movie, the Walt Disney movie, the first National Treasure movie uh, was a Masonic ritual from start to finish. I mean, you were literally watching when you watch that movie, you were watching a free Masonic ritual on screen. Now, if a person doesn't like Freemasons and thinks, you know, well, you know, this is a Freemason talking, I'm not I'm going to tune him out, you know, or whatever. Well, you know, my, my response to that is really there's nothing I can do about it. Um, I don't worry about stuff like that. I can only present the material as I understand it. If I, it that, that's, some, that's a de- decision that's out of my control. If a person wants to tune me out um, and not listen, you know, because of my Masonic membership, certainly that's their right and their privilege. Um, and, you know, I, I don't uh, I mean, I, I just present the material. People like it. They like it. If they don't, there's really not much I can do about it. So I don't I don't worry about it too much. You should be a Mason, Graham. <laughs> no way. Maybe I'll go. <laughs> Well, yeah. it's funny because it's it's funny actually. I'm not I'm not gonna I'm not gonna name names, um, but I was I've, I've done a I've done a couple podcasts. Um, I like you said. I think this is my third time on, and uh, I, I was on with another show, and I, it was about my fourth or fifth time on, and it was on Skype. And after the show ended, uh, the, the the guy said, "Don't don't hang up." He said, "I, I want to talk to you," and I said, "Fine." And he ex- exited the. Uh, show and, and we were talking so i want to become a freemason he said i've listened to you now for five times and i'm very interested in this and uh i actually uh reached out to the lodge and his or he, i told him how to go about it to contact the uh lodge in his jurisdiction and sure enough he became a freemason he's going uh through the ritual process i believe as we speak so um it, i have uh had people uh talk to me and uh, wanted to become a freemason afterwards so i guess i must be doing something right <laughs> Does another Mason have to like vouch for you? Is that how it works? Uh, well, the way it works is generally if the, 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 the long and short of it is, is you may have heard this phrase before is to be one, ask one. And the idea is if you, if you know someone who's a Freemason, you want to join, you have to solicit their membership as a Freemason. I'm actually not, not allowed to solicit members. 
Um, I'm not allowed to recruit. Uh, now, to be brutally honest with you, this obviously happens with family members and best friends and things like that. But um, if you asked, um, the, you know, and you asked me how, how to join, I could certainly start the ball rolling. You would probably, you would have to, um, you know, I, I could instruct you on how to go about joining. Um, now, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland. So if you were in Maryland, it would be much more easier because you're where I am. You're in my jurisdiction. If you're outside my jurisdiction in another one of the 50 states or in, in another country, Canada, such as where you guys are, um, it might be it's, it, in, in the United States, it's not as hard. I'd have to look into Canada, but I don't think uh, that would be a problem either. Um, but I mean, I, I could I mean, I, I could tell you what to do. I mean, I could try instruct you as to what steps you would need to take. Now, again, if you were in Maryland, it would be a little bit easier because you'd be where I am. But if you're outside of Maryland, um, I, I could instruct you on the steps you would need to take. I've done it. I've done it for like seven or eight people um, who have said, you know, hey, I want to join. I'm in Connecticut. I'm in New York. You know, I'm wherever. And I tell them what they need to do. In Calgary, we have an open house every, uh, or not we, but they have an open house. Whoa. <laughs> they have an open house every year that you can go to and ask a bunch of questions and find out. So it's pretty, there I, I went there I went there once and yeah. I going to go. Yeah. The guy, the guy I was like, talking to there was talking about esoteric and I, it took me a while to figure out what he was talking about. And instead of saying esoteric, he was saying, I thought, well, maybe that's how the Freemasons pronounce esoteric. <laughs> or he's mispronouncing erotica. Yeah. Yeah. I've never heard of, I've never even heard it closely pronounced that way. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't. So, but most of the Freemasons I've met, I mean, you guys seem like fascinating people that are into learning all kinds of stuff and, and helping each other through it and, and just very, you know, curious and curious people. But do you, can you, you know, can you say that like the level 33rds aren't running the world in some sort of secret fashion? I mean, are you guys comfortable saying that? Well, I mean, I can, I can only answer the question this way. Um, I mean, I don't have a problem with anyone asking me this. I've been asked this many a time before. Um, I've been involved with Freemasonry for 20 years now. Uh, I've been in the Blue Lodge for 20, over 20. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've been in the Scottish Rite for almost, let's see, almost 18 years now. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, in, in all my time in Freemasonry, I have never encountered anything remotely close to a Illuminati, devil-worshipping cabal that is trying to take over the world or the government. Um, I've never encountered it. If, if it's there, I have never seen it. Um, I, there is very powerful people in Freemasonry. It is influential. It is involved in the community. Uh, I do not dispute any of that. There is p powerful people in Freemasonry, uh, you know, politicians and, and, and movers and shakers and philanthropists and people of that sort. Mm -hmm. um, I have never encountered any sort of demonic hellbent cabal uh, that was trying to take over the government or anything like that. Now, I can tell you, and I talk about this in my first book, The Royal Arch of Enoch, and I mean, I'm not, you know, I, I mean, I don't back away from it. Um, now, it wasn't evil, but there was, in the early days of the United States, the secret cabal of Masons running the show behind the government. That did happen. Um, it wasn't sinister. Um, that was viewed as sinister. But the guys who were doing it were trying to unify the country because it was still a fledgling nation. Um, and it, when this thing blew up in the mid 1820s, this is what led to all this, you know, conspiracy talk. And, you know, are these guys still around or these guys, the puppet masters, things like that? What it seems to have happened was it, it kind of disabled this Masonic cabal completely. But the whispers and the conspiracy still survived. And then especially now when you get into looking at the architecture of places like Washington, D.C., you know, or Baltimore and the Masonic symbolism, a lot of people see this stuff as, you know, this evidence of this overarching, dark, demonic Masonic conspiracy where these guys were using the tools of Masonry to nation build. Uh, and that's what was really going on. And then these guys would have been freaking out if they thought there was anything evil with any of this stuff. Uh, you know, this was all stuff coming out of the Enlightenment, out of the Renaissance, coming out of, I mean, now it's a little, you know, occultish. I mean, no question about it. You're dealing with Things relating to Christian Kabbalah and Hebrew Kabbalah and mysticism and the ancient mystery schools and things like that. But um, essentially, these guys were in the early days of the country using Freemasonry as not only an institution to mold the government around, but it was also to use its symbols and instruments uh, and philosophies to nation build. So that's what's going on. But no, um, I mean, I think Freemasonry is interesting. Um, I've been involved with it for 20 years. Um, I, I'm better off for being in it. Like I said, it, it's taught me to learn and to see the world differently and to use 
you know, to, to look at things symbolically. That's one of the things for me at any rate that it's it's taught me. And um, like I said, if, if, if this is there, uh, I've never seen it. Yeah, no, thanks for explaining that. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, it's, it is good to, I mean, that's what I, what I figure, but it's good to hear it from, from people. And I'm sure our listeners will appreciate your, you know, your candid, candidness on that. Sure. I mean, I, I don't mind talking about it. And like I said, if, if it's there, I've never seen it. Yeah. And just cause a few guys in, in them, in the, you know, in Freemasonry get together. And I mean, of course, you know, the, you know, a few guys that are powerful get together doesn't mean that all of Freemasonry is in, in on this thing or something, you know? I mean, I'm sure there's a bunch of different, you know, like you said, movers and shakers and stuff within the organization that are doing their own thing. And it doesn't mean that uh, it's, it's this big overarching conspiracy. Right. I mean, I think, I think that's a really, I think that's a really good way to uh, look at it. And, you know, I mean, are there, is there a dark side to it? I mean, have there been people involved with it, but maybe been unsavory? Of course. I mean, you're, you're going to find that in any walk of life, in any occupation, in any sort of group. I mean, there's always going to be a black sheep. I mean, that, that's impossible uh, to avoid. Uh, but, you know, you know, when, when you're doing masonry and, you know, how big it is and how large it is, I mean, sure, of course, you're always going to get, you know, the, you know, someone in there who's a dark figure. I mean, I, that's always kind of interesting to me. Um, you know, the Aleister Crowley types. I mean, those are the ones that everyone wants to talk about anyway. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah, exactly. I mean, right. No one wants to talk about you know, you know, whoever, uh, you, know, you know, William McKinley, everyone wants to talk about, you know, Aleister Crowley and A.E. Waite, you know, and the Golden Dawn and, you know, all that good stuff. But no, um, you know, I, like I said, I've been involved with it and uh, I, I, I'm proud of my membership. I would never deny it. I don't hide. I don't hide it or anything like that. I'm completely open with it. And I, I do my best whenever I'm on these shows such as yours to uh, try to be as you know candid as possible and answer all your questions. So, you know, you ask, go ahead, ask me anything you want to about masonry, about movies, go right ahead. <laughs> I will, because <laughs> one of the movies that affected me most as a kid was The Warriors back in the, now, I don't uh, know, I think it's from the late 70s, but I mean, I don't remember seeing it until the probably the early 80s. I mean, it was probably one of those ones that was more popular, like a few years later. Is that the one where the kids like meet in the park and fight? No, you're thinking of a different one. You're thinking of... Uh, I don't think I've seen the war. No, yeah, you're thinking of it. I know which one you're thinking of with all that the the Rat Pack and all those guys. Or whatever. guys in it. Yeah, the, that's a different movie. Okay, this is a gang gang from New York. Dennis kind Swade of thing. is that his name? No, not Dennis Swade. My Patrick God. Swayze. The Swayze. You're, you're thinking. You're thinking the Outsiders. Yes, that's thank you, right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, the, the the Warriors. Um, <laughs> if you'd like me to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Warriors. I'm so you know this is this is one of my all time favorite movies. The yeah, Warriors. Yeah. I mean, this was um, this. This I think it came out in around 1979, 1980. Uh, if you ask me to rattle off probably my top five movies, The Warriors would be in there. Yeah, me too. And and this is a great movie. It's a great movie anyway. If you've never seen it, by all means, check it out. It has so it has a great Gnostic undercurrent with this movie, uh, and uh, it, it's definitely there. And I mean, it, it, it involves this whole idea of journey to selfhood of receiving light, of receiving wisdom, of having your Gnostic epiphany. I mean, Gnosticism, you know, is a theology. The word Gnosis or Gnostic literally means to know. And, and this is what this movie is about. It's to know thyself. Um, so we have, uh, esoterically, let's let's go into it a little bit. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we have these gangs coming together. They're all battling in New York City, uh, these different gangs. And they're very colorful. If you ever see the movie, I mean, the gangs are all kind of, you know, strange wear different costumes, things like that. Kind of like the baseball and, gang yeah. and the roller, the guys on the roller blades. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. The, the baseball furies and the yeah, guys on yeah. the roller skates. And, you know, when they come together, they, they call it truce. They're not going to fight each other. And they come to the, this, this meeting in the Bronx in this park where the biggest gang of all is called the Gramercy Riffs. They're led by a guy named Cyrus. He's going to, they have this truce where they're not going to fight each other this night. They're going to meet and, they're, and he's going to try to unite them all under this one banner, become this one super gang, and then battle the cops and try to take over New York. That's the idea. Cyrus gets shot uh, at the very beginning and all of this falls apart and the truce falls apart and they have to battle their way back uh, to, to Coney Island, which is their turf. This is their little world of materialism. And uh, they, they, um, they get, the, the murder gets pinned on them. The word gets out that they killed him, but of course they're not. They're innocent. There's been another gang that's done it who's gotten away with it at the time. But interesting name to give to the guy Cyrus, who's trying to uh, unify the gangs in New York, a uh, reference to Cyrus the Great, 
the Persian emperor who is trying to unify the different parts of Persia under one banner. This is what Cyrus is trying to do in New York, unify all the gangs together. Great uh, symbolism with the name. So we have the warriors battling these other gangs to go back to need to their little piece of turf. Um, and as they battle, the, the, the gangs that they're fighting against are sort of mirror reflections of themselves. Uh, they, they battle, uh, they fight. Uh, and the whole idea is as they're doing this, they're gaining wisdom, they're gaining knowledge. They finally meet uh, in Gnosticism, in the Gnostic theology, they're, one of the chief tenets is dualism, light, dark, good, evil, male, female. And of course, they meet their sacred feminine in the form of mercy, this street, this woman who's uh, like a street urchin. And of course, they're the warriors, they're warlike, we're dealing with dualism. She's mercy, she's benevolence, she's kindness. So great dualistic interplay there with the male and female. So they continue battling, and then they get back to Coney Island, and this is where they have their Gnostic epiphany, where they're looking over Coney Island, this dilapidated hellhole, the sun's rising in the background, bringing light, wisdom, Gnost you know, gnosis. And uh, Swan has, he's the gang leader, he has this epiphany, he says, this is what we fought all night to get back to. It's a rejection of materialism. He wants something better. Um, he wants something spiritual. Finally, at the end, uh, he gives up the gang banging and he walks off into the sunlight, you know, the light again. He's he's enlightened now and uh, he's going to give up the gang banging. He's going to give up his material ways. Uh, he's going to forsake his little piece of turf for something spiritual. I wouldn't necessarily call this a full blown Gnostic movie in the vein of something like The Matrix or Fight Club or The Truman Show. But it definitely has a Gnostic undercurrent. And I love the name play. Um, interesting. This guy's name is Swan. Of all things, uh, he's the gang leader. He's the guy who kind of gets you know gets enlightened there at the end. Uh, in the ancient mystery tradition, the symbol of the of the candidate when they were initiated into gnosis was Nate was a swan of all things. Wow. Uh, so that's fascinating there. So the entire movie is this journey of self uh, receiving light, receiving wisdom, the interplay with the sacred feminine. Uh, it's very esoteric. It's a great movie anyway. I wouldn't necessarily call this a Gnostic film. I talk about this in Cinema Symbolism too, but it's certainly a movie that flirts with Gnosticism. And uh, it's a great movie anyway. So if you want a good movie to watch and you've never seen it, by all means, check it out. But uh, pay attention to some of the symbolism. Uh, very esoteric. It's a great movie. So would they have been one of the gangs in the gangs in New York? Was it no, like this was, this was, no, this no? was like, well, this was real time, I think. Oh, was it? I think okay. it was real time. Real like, time in the 70s yeah. when I wasn't alive, so yeah. not real time. <laughs> yeah. Right. The movie is set in, the movie is film, was filmed in 1979 and takes place, you know, in that time frame, in the late 1970s, uh, 78, 79. Gangs of New York with Martin Scorsese is another esoteric movie. Um, loads going on in that. That, that mirror, the, the, the symbolism in Gangs in New York with Scorsese is exactly what Sergio Leone does in The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly and some of the other spaghetti westerns. It's good versus evil. It's the Christ figure, uh, light versus darkness, uh, some great symbolism in Scorsese's Gangs in New York. Actually, that's a whole chapter in Cinema Symbolism 2 that I took on. Um, you know, that's a fascinating study as well. One of the one of the themes I hate about about these movies, and I think, I think it's the type you're talking about, is, is that you know how you have all these you know, criminals that you're kind of, um, you know, that you're kind of liking, like they make you sort of like, you know, revere the criminals in a way. And, and yet they're, you know, or, so, or somebody like the hero of the movie is, you know, they're trying to save their family or trying to do that. And yet they're killing all these people along the way. You know, it's this whole, this whole struggle between like saving your one loved one or your one, you know, girlfriend or daughter or son or whatever. Meanwhile, you're killing a bunch of people. And it always just seems like, frustrating to me that that uh that, you know that they they're all these people are falling in love with these characters that are really like the good and evil part of it is sort of like it's not really true it's it's like there's good and evil on, on both sides right what you're talking about i think is what's called the anti-hero uh this is the figure who is is a villain but he's revered yeah uh, and and you know these these movies often have these, these movies often have three interplays going on. It's you have the hero, the villain, and the villain is usually, a, a, a you know, a, is someone you're rooting against. Then you have the anti-hero who's a villain, but is the person you're rooting for. Um, and examples of the, you know, this is a very powerful figure in film. Uh, so, for example, the, the, the anti-hero, I mean, two of the biggies out there, the, big, the biggest anti-hero of all that I can think of is Hannibal Lecter. Um, 
you know, I mean, the mass murderer who everyone likes. Um, you know, and you watch Silence of the Lambs. You know, the villain is Buffalo Bill. No one, no one likes him. I mean, he's a legitimate, you know, bad guy. But Lecter is just as evil. But you root for him as well. You root for him like you're rooting for Clary Starling, um, the Severus Snape figure in uh, in uh, the Harry Potter is is the same sort of character, um, almost Darth Vader in Star Wars. Um, you know, the villain, but he's not quite as evil as the Emperor. What about Billy the Kid and like, remember those old Young Guns movies? Those were the fucking shit. Yeah, it's 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 just a you know archetype that you know is a villain, but you're, he's a likable villain, and uh, you know it's 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 a uh, powerful archetype. I mean, a lot a lot of these characters are embodiments of archetypal imagery. You know, the solar resurrected god man, the sun hero, the lunar heroine. Uh, the mother, the trickster, you know, the, the hermit. Um, the, these are all very powerful archetypes that turn up in film. Uh, and uh, this is another study, is archetypal imagery, archetypal characters. Uh, when you start dissect, dissecting some of this, uh, you will find the same, these same characters turning up over and over again. Um, I mean, in a lot of cases, they even look alike. Um, you know, when, when you get into the hermit figure, you know, the, the wizard figure, you know, the god of magic, you know, you turn to Albus Dumbledore, you turn to Obi-Wan Kenobi, you turn to Gandalf the Grey. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, they all look alike. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's the old gray beard, yeah. you know, who has all the wisdom and is built those out piecemeal. So, yeah, I mean, you know, you, you get into the actual characters um, and, you know, what they represent. That's that can be another po- another way of powerfully communicating with your subconscious mind. Do you think that negatively affects our culture, though? Like, all this glorifying violence and glorifying crime. Like, I feel like the big anti-heroes these days are these criminals, like the the crime capers. Like, you know, those, either they're international intrigue or those real high-tech crime capers. And, you know, like, you're, you're kind of, you know, you're with the guy who's committing all these crimes. You want them to succeed in a way, yet it's like, it's like high-end crime. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I mean, obviously, Matu, m- movies have a great impact on society, material culture, popular culture, culture in general. Um, I guess whether it's good or bad is somewhat of a, subject, a subjective study. Um, you know, you, you, you know, I, I don't know how many Hannibal Lecter T-shirts or anything like that I've ever seen. But certainly you get into, you know, like Star Wars figures. I mean, you got the Darth Vader figure and stuff like that. But, you know, I mean, is that evil? I mean, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, it's more like the non, not the not the evil ones. I'm thinking of more of the subtle, like the Ocean's Eleven type, or all these, all these. Uh, you know what I mean? The ones that are that are performing all the heists, that are you know the likable characters, and they're all cool about what they do. And it just, I feel like it's just a negative. Getting all the girls. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I mean, I guess I mean I've never I've watched Ocean's Eleven. I mean, it's just a movie. I mean, I've never really looked at it as too negative. I mean, again, the guy they're going against is sort of like a bastard also. So, you know, I mean, yeah, but, that's usually the case. Know, yeah. Yeah. That's usually the case. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's like, like a Robin know, Hood scenario. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Right. 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 Exactly. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, and you know, is it evil? I mean, I don't know. I mean, I guess that's kind of a subjective point of view, but um, I mean, the, the, you know, movies, movies are powerful. I mean, it's probably one of the most popular, you know, or most powerful mediums out there right now, I would think. And uh, certainly these guys who are behind it, you know, I, I am 100 percent convinced know what they're doing. Uh, not all cases, but a lot of them do. And uh, when it comes to placing this stuff in films, you know, really a lot of them really take it to a, 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 another level. Uh, you know, it, it, it goes well beyond just looking for, you know, this or that. I mean, some of these guys really hide this stuff really well. I mean, I, I can't tell you. I mean, I, I've been, been on other shows. I mean, I, I just. You know, real quick, I'll end on this. You know, for me at any rate, doing this, I mean, I have to watch. I, I could never do this in a movie theater. I mean, if I go to a movie theater, I'm probably going to watch the movie for fun. Yeah, I may make some mental notes if I see something. But I, I have to have the movie here. I mean, I have to pause it. <laughs> it I mean, I'm constantly fast-forwarding it backwards, forwards. I get, does this scene relate to this scene? The dialogue, the costuming. I mean, it's it's watching these movies four, five, six times, sometimes more than that. And especially scenes. Um, I mean, it should be some damn the smallest thing in the background of the scene that could tip you off to something huge going on uh, inside the movie. So, yeah, it's it's deep, but it's a deep study. What was your favorite one in the new book? Well, my favorite movie to take on? Yeah. Or, oh. or maybe even the one that ended up being your favorite in the end. Good question. Oh, boy. You know, I think for me, 
Um, my favorite chapter to write. So it, it's, it's one of my all time favorite um, uh, genres. And it was really fun for me to write. And it's one of my all time favorite movies anyway. So it was probably, I guess, really enjoyed was the Western chapter. I, I have a chapter uh, called uh, in the book called Mystical Archetypes of the Old West. And I took on uh, five movies in that chapter. Uh, the first was Red River, uh, which is this John Wayne movie, which has a lot of masculine archetypes. Uh, it's, it's really a prototypical film when it comes to masculine archetypes. Uh, the, the archetypes in that movie you will see repeat all over the place. The other movie, the, the other movie I took on uh, was the uh, Magnificent Seven, uh, and this was the original one with Yul Brenner and uh, Steve McQueen. Um, and, and those characters are also archetypal. Um, as well. But then the other three movies were the Spaghetti Westerns of Sergio Leone, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly. Well, let's see, do them in order. It would be uh, Fistful of Dollars for a Few Dollars More and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. And uh, those are great movies. I mean, The, the Good, The Bad, and The Ugly, I, you know, you asked me about The Warriors being in my top five. Good, The Bad, and The Ugly is probably my top three. Uh, that's one of my all time favorite movies. And, and Le Leone, uh, the director, was Roman Catholic. And, and he really, really plays around in those movies with religion especially with Christianity. Uh, it's what I would call occult Christianity, almost Kabbalah with a C, not a K. Uh, it's mystical Roman Catholicism, uh, where you have a whole interplay of good versus evil, light versus dark. Uh, he, he gets involved with it in the first movie in A Fistful of Dollars. And he kind of takes his pedal off, he takes his foot off the pedal a little, little bit when he does the second movie. It's there, but it's not It's not as in your face with, with a four, few dollars more. But then he hits full stride with Good, the Band, the Ugly. I mean, that's just one giant epic religious battle. And uh, it's interesting because years later, this is what I was just mentioning, uh, another Roman Catholic director named Martin Scorsese takes this exact same imagery, this mystical Roman Catholicism uh, going on in, in, uh, in, in The Good, the Band, the Ugly, and he uses it in a movie called Gangs in New York. It's, it's almost the exact same imagery, um, the same themes at any rate, good versus evil, God versus the devil, uh, things like that nature. So to answer your question, I would say, you know, you know, it was one of my favorite movies anyway, but really doing the Western chapter, I, I really had a good time and I, I really, I really enjoyed writing that. Huh. What do you think? What do you think about good versus evil and good and evil? We had a guest on recently, Grant Cameron, and he's, he's just maintained this for a couple of years now. We've had him on a couple of times about, you know, it's, it's such a subjective thing that he he doesn't really he just thinks that it's that you can't just say good and evil. You know, who who decides what's good and what's evil? Well, right. In in the movie, it's much more. You know, I mean, sure, you know, good versus evil can always be subjective. I mean, you know, what was it? And I always harken back to the line in Excalibur where Merlin says, "Good and evil, you can never have one without the other." Uh, and I think he's right on the money there. Um, but certainly when you get into the archetypes, I mean, you, you, you have a well-delineated villain, a well-delineated savior figure, Christ. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, this is especially true in, in I mean, Scorsese and Leone definitely are investing their movies with the Christ versus the devil imagery in, in Good, the Band, the Ugly and Gangs in New York. I mean, that's definitely going on. Um, and, uh, you know, but, you know, pulling away from the movies. Yeah. I mean, sure. Good versus evil. You know, I mean, it's, you know, as a lawyer, um, you know, one of the first things they teach you in law school is, um, there's no such thing as black and white. Um, there is no good. There is no evil. There's only shades of gray. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, there's, there's never 100% guilt and there's never 100% innocence. Um, it's only shades of gray and, you know, it, it's just where you fall on the spectrum. Huh. So as a lawyer, that's just me as a lawyer speaking. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I agree. I kind of tend to agree with him. You know, it, it can be subjective. It, you know, usually is never 100% um, one way or the other. Nothing is 100% evil and probably nothing's 100% good either. I like that. Good and evil is a spectrum, just yeah. like gender. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, <laughs> Go ahead. I like the movie breakdowns but i haven't seen the good the bad and the ugly well, we don't how have, have i not seen that we should i'd like to break down another movie before we wrap up well let's how about getting into his his chapter on the masonic influences in those movies and we can talk about that before we go which one i'd how like about, to do like nash did we do national treasure well, the last time no but you you've got a chapter where you break down uh, the Mas masonic influences in, in movies right yeah, I mean, I get into some Masonic, uh, I'm trying to think what, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I have a chat, hang on, the book's right here. Yeah, I think, uh, I think it was, sitting right next to me. Uh, was let the me, movie I was thinking of Eyes Wide Shut, I think, in the uh, oh, National yeah, that's a good movie. one, too, yeah, and The Shining, 
Everyone's yeah, well, seen The Shining. Yeah, I have a chapter on uh, masonry. I have a chapter on ice, or it cha- it's not a chapter; it's a section of a chapter in uh, uh, on the Illuminati. Chapter six is Freemasonry in popular culture. Uh, I talked about the Ninth Gate, or excuse me, I talked about National Treasure in uh, Royal Arch of Enoch, but we can certainly revisit that. Uh, I got into um, you know the the Kubrick Eyes Wide Shut, The Shining. So let's do The you Shining know. and Eyes Wide Shut. Fine. Um, we'll we'll start with uh, how about Eyes Wide Shut? We'll start with that. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, this favorite. Is a, yeah, this is a great movie. This is uh, what I called in the book. Uh, I, I, call, I, I titled this uh, Kubrick's Illuministic Impulse, Eyes Wide Shut. Clearly, you have a Illuminati-styled uh, organization in this uh, movie. Uh, it trades on uh, you know, groups such as the Illuminati. Uh, you, know, you get into the OTO with the sex magic, uh, the secret you know, organization with you know, masonry and things like that. Um, very interesting symbolism that Kubrick uses. Uh, the movie takes place at Christmas time, um, and he bombards you with Christmas lights uh, from start to finish. These really, it's not the little subtle white ones. It's the real gaudy, in your face, blue, oranges, greens, reds, Christmas lights. And these are always surrounded by the ills of mankind, the ills of humankind, prostitution, drug overdose, drug addiction, child pornography, pedophilia. Um, he's surrounded, you know, prostitution, the, 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 these Christmas lights and these plagues of mankind walk hand in hand. And he's doing that on purpose. He's showing you the ills of mankind, how bad mankind is. But then you get the Tom Cruise character and he goes out to the uh, mansion where the Illuminati is and there's no Christmas lights uh, whatsoever. It's devoid of Christmas. And by doing that, what Kubrick is telling you is, OK, this is the real evil. Uh, <laughs> you know, for, Forget about the little things that torment mankind, the pedophilia, the drug addiction. This is nothing compared to this true evil that's out there. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's very symbolic. You have um, them performing the sex magic rituals. Uh, you know, you know, Tom Cruise is in, in, in the mask. Uh, and then you have the red cloaked uh, master of ceremonies. Uh, you have the magic circle there uh, with the women, with the naked women. Um, the, the master of ceremonies pay attention to this when he's using the incense, uh, is casting the, the circle backwards. He's moving uh, counterclockwise. Uh, this is in witchcraft, what is known as vittershins. Uh, that's black magic when you move counterclockwise. So we're dealing with black magic right off the bat. Um, and, uh, you know, you know uh, what is it that uh, Kubrick does? Oh, he interplays, he uses the, the schemes to let you know that this is really happening. Um, it's on a red, it's, it's on the red carpeting. And then later on in the movie, when uh, Sidney Pollack is uh, explaining that this is real, it's over the red pool table, that's to make you draw you back, that, you know, this is really, you know, happening. Then again, with the little girl at the end, where she's in the toy store and she's by the game called Magic Circle. And again, that's taking you back to the uh, magic circle cast by red cloak. Um, so it's a great movie. It's one of those movies where, um, for me, if you watch the movie without paying attention to the symbolism, uh, the movie to me is very boring. Uh, it's, it's not interesting, but when you watch it with a symbolic lens, uh, you put on a pair of symbolic glasses, um, not literally, of course, but you watch it symbol- symbolically. The movie is very entertaining. Um, it's, it's, it's a great movie. Um, I, I like it very much. I mean, I, I like the messages that it, it has in it. I like the hidden meanings. Um, I, I like the symbolism of it. I mean, you even have it where Red Cloak's chair has the double eagles on the background. I mean, that's the symbol of the Scottish Rite, high degree masonry. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, some just great esoteric imagery in Eyes Wide Shut. Um, this is a, a movie I took on in Cinema Symbolism too, And then, of course, uh, you know, one of the granddaddies of them all, The Shining by Stanley Kubrick, the same director. Uh, based on the novel of Stephen King, uh, what you have going on, what Kubrick does in this one is he repeats everything. Uh, this this movie is a temple of repetition, is what I call it. Uh, it's an oral chorus. Uh, it, it, everything is biting its tail. It's just an endless cycle of, re, uh, of repetition. And the reason Kubrick uh, does this is to bombard your subconscious mind with this notion that the Overlook Hotel is an Ouroboros. It's an endless, vicious reincarnation cycle that never ends, that the characters are forever trapped there, they can't escape, and that everything repeats. Um, So to convey this repetition, he repeats everything. Um, Everything in this movie repeats or is presented in doubles. Um, So where do you want to start with this? We have uh, the number 12 repeats. He, He likes to repeat the number 12. 
Um, the hotel room or the hotel is KDK 12, uh, the room number 237. If you add it up, you get the number 12. Um, two date dates, two time of days are presented on the screen, eight and four. Add that up to get the number 12. Um, Scatman Crothers tells you that there are, what is it, 12 bags of black molasses and 24, you know, pork roasts, and it's 12 times two and 12 pounds of sugar. Uh, Jack Torrance throws the ball against the wall 12 times. Shelley Duvall and the little boy take 12 turns in the hedge maze. We and have, what's the 12 again, sorry? I'm sorry, what was that? Did you say what the 12 is for already? Uh, well, it's a number he likes to repeat. Oh. Uh, well, we have several numbers that he likes to repeat. Uh, the number 21 uh, repeats. Uh, the number 42 repeats. If you take 237, the room number, and multiply it, you get the number 42. <laughs> You'll find the number 42 on Scatman Crothers' license plate. The little boy at the beginning is wearing the number 42 um, on his jersey. The movie that they're watching in the hotel is the summer of 42. The <laughs> number 21 repeats. Uh, there are seven frames of three rows. Uh, a lot the- of that can break down to three. Yeah. The, the 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 number uh, the, the the road that he go is driving one at the beginning of the film it was built in 1921 um, so so you have this nine of doubles you have two hedge you have two mazes the hedge maze and the boiler or the the maze inside the, the hallways of the overlook there's two boilers Shelley Duvall serves him two eggs uh, there are two tw- sets of twins uh, Jack Torrance has two twenties and two tens in his wallets. There's two Portlands mentioned. Um, everything in this movie is presented in doubles and repetition. Everything. Um, in fact, characters even say lines back to each other a few lines later. Um, you know, what is it? The mother says, keep America clean. And the little boy says, yeah, we got to keep America clean. The girls say, the twin girls say, stay with us forever and ever. And then Jack Torrance a few minutes later is sitting on the bed and says to the son, I want to stay here forever and ever. Uh, so ev- everything in this movie is complete repetition. It's just an endless bombardment of numbers, doubles that Kubrick uh, does. Uh, it's a fascinating study. I get into it much more in, in, in the book. I'm just scratching the surface with it. But um, it's, it's endless repetition in The Shining, and it's done to blast your subconscious mind with this idea that the Overlook Hotel is just an Ouroboros forever biting itself and that literally everything inside this place, including the lives of the characters, repeat. Interesting movie, fantastic movie, great study. Yeah, really fascinating. So now that you've been doing this cinema symbolism for a few years now and you've written two books and you've got a third one coming, do you find that Hollywood has changed over the years lately? Is it is it more shallow now? Is it harder to find these deeper symbolic movies, or have you noticed any shift at all? No, I, I, I the, the that's a great question. Um, I actually, I'm actually uh, going to do Cinema Symbolism three. Um, I'm actually getting ready to publish my first book of fiction. Once that comes out, I've got a couple books I'm playing around with. But no, this symbolism with the films, um, great question. It goes back in time. Um, you could find this in movies from. The 40s and the 50s with The Wizard of Oz, certainly the movies of universal horror based on, you know, things like Dracula and Frankenstein. You're dealing with a lot of mystical occult elements there. Uh, You get into the 60s with James Bond that has esoteric in it. Um, So, no, it's it's you know, you get into, you know, you even want to go back further in time. I mean, we get into the works of Mozart, the magic flute, very occult. Uh, Shakespeare was obsessed with ghosts and witchcraft. So, you know, we got, you know, the occult with him. Uh, so, no, um, Hollywood uh, seems to be very interested in this since day one. I mean, you you go back to Hollywood's start, you know, where you look at a movie like Nosferatu, um, you know, based on Dracula, that that's, you know, very symbolic. You get into a movie uh, like Metropolis, uh, very Gnostic, very occult mm-hmm. um, movie as well. So, yeah, this has been going on from day one. Yeah, and it still uh, is. Yeah, it still is, and I don't think it's going to stop anytime soon. Uh, when I was writing, I'll just end the question on this, when I was writing um, Cinema Symbolism 1, I did a sequel off of it because there were movies I wanted to put in it, but there was no room. Naturally, when I was writing Cinema Symbolism 2, there was movies I wanted to talk about, but the book was already long enough, so I thought, okay, well, let me do Cinema Symbolism 3. Uh, so, yeah, it's, uh, it's a deep study, and uh, you know, I, I don't see it any anytime soon. <laughs> Can you, is there anything we could be watching now? Like, is there anything you're watching currently that's got a bunch of stuff in it that maybe our our, our listeners can kind of get in early and, and start looking for stuff? Absolutely. Sure. Great question. Um, new movies. Absolutely. New TV shows. Um, take a look. I haven't seen Rogue One yet. 
Um, but the last Star Wars movie, Episode Seven, was loaded with esoteric symbolism, uh, a lot of Gnostic themes, a lot of anti-Christian themes in, in, in Episode Seven. So we have Episode Eight coming out soon. Um, so I'd want to keep an eye out for that. You, you're going to want to watch that symbolically. Um, I don't know if you get in Canada, I'm not saying this to be flip or anything like that. I don't know if you get American TV shows or anything like that um, or, or, or how it works up there. Uh, there was a show here in the United States that aired for five years on A&E, uh, Arts and Entertainment Network, called Bates Motel, which was, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. If you're not, I'll, I'll just shut up. But it, Yeah, it, I've seen that on the guide anyway. I haven't yeah. watched it. Okay, well, they, they, it was on for five years, and, and episodes, or excuse me, seasons one through four, um, I'll have to go back and take a look at them, but I, I watch, I've watched all of it. And uh, episodes, or excuse me, I keep saying that, at seasons one through four uh, seemed to be straight up on their face, but when they got to season five, they really overloaded it with a lot of esoteric symbolism. Uh, this was a show that just wrapped up not a few months ago, uh, so, so that was recent. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, you, 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 you're going to want to take a look at this new star Wars movie. Like I said, episode seven had a lot, I've not seen rogue one yet. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm going to have to withhold commentary on that, but uh, I'm most anxious to see episode seven. I want to see if they continue on with the symbolism from uh, episode seven. Right on. So can you give us a teaser into, into your third book and what you're going to be hitting there? Sure. I, I I sure can. Um, this is, well, right now. Um, what I'm doing is um, um, I'm getting ready to publish. This will happen probably in the next two two months or so. My first work of fiction um, that's going to be coming out probably around the end of November, early December. Uh -huh. uh, that that's my next project. Uh, that's what the the book is actually with the editor right now. So um, you know, once once that gets out, then I can really start concentrating on some, on some other books. Um, I'm working on another book on Freemasonry. I'm working on some more works of fiction, but I have started outlining Cinema Symbolism three. So, yeah, I have a chapter in Cinema Symbolism 2 on Walt Disney, some of the movies at Disney. There's some more movies at Disney I want to talk about, so we're going to revisit that. I want to revisit the David Lynch uh, material that I left out of Cinema Symbolism 2, such as Twin Peaks, Eraserhead, uh, the one with Nick Cage and Laura Dern, Dern. I always am forgetting the name. Wild at Heart. I want to take a look at that. Um, and, of course, both series of Twin Peaks, parts one from the 90s and part two that just recently aired. And, of course, Firewalk with me. Uh, so we're going to be taking a look at that. Um, we're going to do the Star Wars movie. We're going to do Bates Motel uh, for um, for Cinema Symbolism 3. Uh, so there's, there's a bit of a teaser for you. I'm still outlining it. Um, but, yeah, it's going to be a whole new slate of movies. And um, that, that's books, to be brutally honest with you, probably still a year or two away. But, um, yeah, I have started outlining it. Nice. Yeah. I'm looking forward to that. It's like a series. Yeah. <laughs> a series of Cinema Symbolism. Hey, why not? Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> It's a good one. Everyone loves movies. Everyone. Yeah, absolutely. And I like doing it. I like writing about it. I like dissecting it. So, uh, yeah, we're, we're going to uh, continue on with it. Right on. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for coming on again. Yeah, you have to come back when Symbolism 4 comes out. I mean, your fiction <laughs> book comes out, too, yeah? Yeah. Did you want to take a break? Did you want to wrap up? I mean, was, was you tell me. We're, I got an hour up on the screen for this, so. Yeah, we'll wrap it up. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, might as well. I mean, you can. Uh, where should people go to find your uh, find your work? Well, thank you guys, uh, Darren and uh, Graham, for having me on tonight. It was a pleasure to you know come on Gramerica again. Third time's always a charm. <laughs> sure, and I absolutely look uh, forward to coming back uh, with the work of fiction or Cinema Symbolism Three or my new book on Freemasonry again. I, I really appreciate you having me on. It's a tremendous show you have, and uh, I really do appreciate it. I mean that. Um, yeah, uh, if you're interested in the, what I've been talking about tonight and you're interested in my work, the easiest way to find me is just go to my website. My name, my full name is Robert W. Sullivan, the fourth. Uh, so that's just my website. It's www. Robert W. Sullivan, I V the letter I, the letter V for the fourth Robert W. Sullivan, Uh, links to buy my books. Uh, it's very easy to navigate. You can get the book in the the books in the ebook format, Kindle Nook. You can buy the print copies. It's uh, they're available on all major online retailers: Amazon, Barnes and Noble, Books a Million, and they're on um, Amazon Canada as well. So they're readily available. Um, there's information there about upcoming events and appearances, radio shows, podcasts. I'm going to be doing links to my social media. Follow me on Twitter. I have a YouTube channel with playlists with extensive, uh, you know, radio shows and podcasts. I've been on that content is all free. So just go to my website. Very easy to navigate all the information there to buy the books. 
Um, and again, it's www.robertwsullivaniv.com. One more time, robertwsullivaniv.com. Nice. Yeah, thanks for coming and on. And check out really the last two episodes, yeah. too, yeah, because yeah. there's a two other ones. They're both great. We'll link to them in the show notes so you can jump into another. another I think there's another two and a half hours of yeah. us with Robert talking there about movies. And the, and the first one is all about we, we go deep into the... The Royal Arch of Enoch. Yeah, into yeah. the... Uh, Freemason stuff. Yeah, and thanks for being so honest about all that stuff. Really appreciate being able to ask you all those questions, and uh, you know, it's I really do appreciate that. No, I appreciate you having me on. It's always a pleasure, and I don't mind answering your questions at all. And, and thank you again for having me on Gramerica. It's a tremendous show, and I really appreciate it. What's your Twitter handle again? My Twitter handle is uh, at uh, Rob W Sullivan Four. And the four is the number four at okay. Rob W. Sullivan four. Okay. I got a link to that in the show notes here as well. So, okay, great. Okay. okay thanks, thanks Robert. Thanks for coming on. Okay. Have a great night. You, thank you guys. And that was a chat with, uh, Robert W. Sullivan, the fourth Sully Sully as he's affectionately known in Grimerica. <laughs> of course, you guys that have been around from day one will have probably heard, uh, the last couple episodes we had with Robert. They're fun. They're great uh, as well. He's a great interview. Um, but yeah, we do have good. a whack of new listeners, so they're worth going back to check out. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I like how he digs into all that symbolism. I mean, that's uh, very, it's very interesting, and how he's not afraid to approach the collective unconscious. Like it's not all intentionally put there. You know, something's going on. Yeah, I like it. His him and him and uh, Plate should get in touch. Yeah, and, yeah, and Jay and Dyer, they they could they, all get uh, together and just have a movie megalomaniac. <laughs> I don't think that's the right word. No, got, but it got away from me there while I was saying it. I just had to say stuff. No, but there's a lot of, I feel like there's a lot of what Plate and Dyer could tie into what Robert does. Like, there's all these things that connect all the different movies together and the dates and the times and all the weird, the weird stuff, you know? Like, besides just yeah, being remember, the didn't we do Back one. to the Future in the last one? Back to the 88 and everything yeah. is all crazy. I've been meaning to watch that YouTube video oh, about Black keep... to the Future. Oh, I just been meaning to watch Back to the Future. Did you just say Black to I the did, Future? Yeah. Jesus Christ. Grandmakeramerica.com. Uh, so, yeah, big thanks to Sully for coming back on the show. Uh, buy the book. Check him out on Twitter. Check out grandmerica.ca slash support, guys. If you can, sign up for a monthly. There's a bunch of different options there. If you're getting some value from the show, you can get, throw some value back. Winter's coming. It's getting cold. You can sign up for a monthly, everything from a buck a month to 30 bucks a month. You email me if you want something different or custom. Of course, that's going to get you access to the extra couple episodes a month we got of the Black Budget feed. And that uh, really does help out big time. Um, I think we're still hovering a little under like 1% of conversions, maybe around 1%. percent I'd like to see that number get to two. Yeah, for sure. Right yeah, we couldn't do it without the support. No, we couldn't. I mean, we couldn't. We wouldn't be going on this long. No. That's right. Winter's coming. Support the store if you can. Of course, if you can't afford to support the show monetarily, there's a ton of different ways. Oh, just by going push. to the show notes. Review. Review it. Review the show. You can do that. Uh, the big one is iTunes. Of course, if you can find someplace else to review the show, do it. I think you can do it on Stitcher, maybe some other places. I'm not sure. Uh, share the show. That's a big one. We have no marketing and no money for marketing. Uh, so we just need you guys to tell people about the show and maybe they'll listen and sign people up for the newsletter. That's another great way. Sign them up for the newsletter. Boom. They get told about the show. They, they don't even know who signed them up. And spam gram. That's the last one. That's the last one. Well, there's a bunch of other stuff. Speak pipe and all that. Jeez. Yeah. We don't get a lot of voicemails. So check out speak bike pipe, speak pipe.com slash America. That's in the show notes too. It's all in the show notes. And you should probably email me back up that you'd left a voicemail because I don't think Darren checks them anyways. No, no, I come off it. I get that. I check those. I check those. Do you? Yeah. I just do you get scan over yours. Yeah, yeah, I get an email. Yeah, I get an email whenever oh, I get one. Oh, really? Okay. Then I, I save them for the show. I should test that out. Do it up. Okay. All right, guys. I think that's about it. That about wraps it up. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week. I said for you. So look at the shape that I'm in now For crying out loud You left me standing in the freezing cold 
Now my tattered umbrella doubles as a lightning rod for lightning bolts. <laughs> if I could abracadabra, I'd reach out and grab you and take you home with me. And baby girl, you'd be my queen. Have I found you? Or is this purgatory a never ending story? And the confusion with the illusion, and the confusion with the illusions, and the confusion with the illusions. Da 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 Is this heaven? Have I found you? Or is this purgatory a never ending story? The confusion with the illusion, and the confusion with the illusion, and the confusion with the illusion. You left me standing in the freezing cold, and now my tattered umbrella doubles as a lightning rod for lightning bolts. If I could abracadabra, I'd reach out and grab ya, take you home with me, baby girl, you'd be my queen. Ooh. If I could abracadabra, I'd reach out and grab ya, take you home with me, baby girl, you'd be my queen. Baby girl, you would be my queen. Baby girl, you'd be my queen. Baby girl, you'd be my queen. Hablando los azules. I want a good skull for my synchronicity. If Graham reads it out, then Daryl might give it to me. Hey, don't you please read it low? Yeah, yeah. If Murray had supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. Send it now. vibrations and stuff like that. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. Underneath breaths of deep gratitude and prayers for guidance and protection. And put on a didgeridoo and shamanic drumming track. Shivers or vibrations and stuff like that. If more you supported the show, I'd be less sick of podcasts. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you.